remarkable. Their goal, I met yesterday for an hour with the Deputy Mayor of the Environment and Transportation, uh, Klaus Bondam, and Klaus Bondam described how their next goal is to hit 50 percent. I mean, to have half your population when they go to work on bicycles, they're healthier, the air is cleaner, there's less carbon emissions, you save money. I mean, the benefits are, are dramatic, and you, you can see the difference just when you walk down the street. I mean, we were just in the city council last night at like 10, 30, 11. The whole bottom floor of this century-old building is filled with not only bicycle racks, but bicycles that right. fill them. And city council members, the guards, everyone are riding in and out of the city council on their bicycles. Yeah, when I flew in, uh, the, the fellow next to me on the, on the plane is a hotshot young technology expert, makes a huge amount of money doesn't own a car, rides his bike, you know, he says, that's oh, healthier, it's more, it's more fashionable, it's, you know, it's what his friends do. And I think that's the whole thing that we get to public sentiment about what Lincoln was talking about. We need to change our public sentiment so people want to do these things and that it's not government coming down and being punitive, but it's creating a, a, a change, a, trans, a transformation in our attitudes. Damon Moglen, do you think the press is uh, creating that um the education necessary for change when you have a media in the United States, for example, brought to us by ExxonMobil, brought to us by Chevron, brought to us by PP. Yeah, no, I, I don't, unfortunately. I think that um, that we, we are not seeing the kind of coverage that we need to be seeing. And I think at the same time that um, Mr. Obama himself needs to step up and talk more about climate change. It, it's, it's obviously correct that he's needed to spend a good deal of time talking about health care reform in our country, and it's a very important issue. But unfortunately, he's done that to the real neglect of talking about climate change. And um, I think we see the ways in which he could be talking about it much more. He could be bringing the public along. I agree with the analogy to, to Lincoln. I think it's very important. The only way we are going to have these kind of changes in the United States is if the public moves along with the policymaking process. Damon, the issue of climate debt. Please explain it, uh, what this means from the developing world uh, or from the developed world to the developing world and where the U.S. stands on this. It is a major issue, uh, one of the major threads that are going through this conference right now and creating a lot of anger. Well, that's right. I, I mean, I, I think you can have no better example than the, the, the younger person you had on earlier on your program. I think that what we have to realize is that there are many countries around the world right now that are experiencing catastrophic effects from climate change, be it sea rise, be it their crops are wilting, be it their livestock are dying, being massive refugee problems now. And this is happening now. And the fact of the matter is that the developed countries, and in particular the United States, created the historical pollution that creates these problems in the developing world. It's not these small countries that have created the greenhouse gas problem. So what we have now is one of the key issues here in Copenhagen is that the developed countries are going to have to fund what is called adaptation and mitigation in the developing countries. They also need to fund the protection of forests around the country, uh, around the world. And this is a critical part of the agreement that has to be reached here. And as much as $140 billion a year may well be the price tag for doing this. And what needs to be realized is that if we don't spend that kind of money, if we do not help the developing countries and the, the countries on the front lines of climate change, there will need to be even more gigantic sums of money that will have to be paid in the future in order to deal with these catastrophic what problems. What is the U.S. pledged? The U.S. pledge, in fact, going into Copenhagen is zero. The U.S. has not categorically stated that it is prepared to put any money on the table. The expectation is that the U.S. will put somewhere in between half a billion and maybe a couple of billion dollars. This is pennies on the dollar of what's needed, absolutely pennies on the dollar of what's really needed. The U.S. should be putting much more of a commitment financially. And you see other, other countries being ready to put much more money on the table in the tune of tens of billions of dollars from Europe, for example. When I saw you yesterday, the Exim Bank uh, had just made a big announcement, the U.S. Exim Bank. Well, that's right. I think this is a remarkable comparison. Yesterday, it was announced that the U.S. government is going to be providing, through Exim Bank, three, export, three, import. the Export Import Bank, $3 billion for the creation of an Exxon subsidized project, a, an Exxon run project in Papua New Guinea. For that same $3 billion, if the United States were putting that and more on the table here at Copenhagen, we would be going a long way towards getting the deal we need. And yet, 
very easily we can give that money to an Exxon project, but we're not giving it to these countries. Why though. do you think President Obama is not being a leader in this area? <clears throat> Look, I, I think that the president is walking into a government that has been moving in a certain direction from the past administration, and it's hard to yank it around. But yank it around, he has got to do now. And particularly with the time constraints of these negotiations, he needs to make some real decisions about what he can bring to the table now, because if we don't bring enough, the negotiations could fail here. Mayor Hickenlooper, who do you think President Obama is surrounding himself by? What stops him from taking uh, more of a leadership role here? Though he did say he's not coming this week, he's coming next week, which many that, feels more so. Right, that was a remarkable uh, uh, willingness to adapt to the situation, changing his schedule, saying, I'm going to come later, we'll make it where I can have the potential. He has greater risk, but he has greater potential to kind of bring everyone together. Again, I think his greatest challenge, he's surrounded himself with a bunch of, with, with some real talent. If you go down and look at, at NOAA, at, at, at the at NRAIL, the Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, a lot of the scientific uh, arenas, he has populated with very talented, very experienced, worldly scientists. But again, he's got to move within public sentiment, within that, that sense. And a lot of issues, I mean, the, the whole question about extreme climate change as being the direct result of, of greenhouse gases, uh, the argument that continually gets put back is look at the Dust Bowl in the Great Depression, right? And that was before we had anywhere like these types of CO2 buildup. How do you tell which dramatic climate changes are the result of, of CO2 emissions and greenhouse gases and which ones aren't? And that's, you know, that level of, of scientific application is still, I mean, I think most people agree that the, the modeling is, again, it's hard work. There's a lot of noise on it. Uh, I think the I think what the real key is, we know that climate change is occurring, right? Everyone knows that. We know it's dramatic. We know that, that mankind is, is, is the likely, the, the vast majority of it is a result of our, of our actions. So we need to address it and move quickly. I think when you start trying to break down which part of the climate disruption is, is a consequence of which pollution images or who's responsible, that's when we get into trouble. I would certainly dramatically agree that we need billions of dollars to... We have to 30 seconds, Greenpeace's demands here at the COP15 mm -hmm. summit. We need, we need to have emissions reductions brought to the table by the president that's in line with the science. It needs to be much larger. He also needs to bring much larger commitment to the table in terms of financing. And the president needs to publicly, openly dedicate the United States to coming here and getting a legally binding agreement. We're going to leave it there. I want to thank you, Damon Moglin, for joining us, Global Warming Campaign Director at Greenpeace USA, and John Hickenlooper, Mayor of Denver. He won the 2009 Mayor's Climate Protection Award for a large city. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. When we come back, we'll be joined by Nigeria's best-known environmental leader, Nemo Bassi. Stay with us. are melting. You know what that means? Everything's going swimmingly. Global warming. It's hot. Global warming. It's not cool. Global warning. This